So this is the last of the sessions, and I'm the only thing that's between you and, uh, I guess, fun times. <laughs> and what, what I hope to do today um, in my remarks is perhaps move a little bit away from hemoglobin, though we seem to be stuck on that, unfortunately. But I also want to make sure that you understand what the rationale behind patient blood management is, why it's important for all in the U.S. And, and importantly, also, as the last man up, I get to change my slides. So, so, so some of you have seen some of what we've been talking about before, but there are some important questions on the uh, anticoagulants, and I'll a I actually added a couple of slides on those. I, I do have just some disclosures, um, uh, ownership of Stock and Portola, uh, Speakers Bureau for uh, Johnson & Johnson and Novartis. Um, but what we're talking about today is we're in a, a transformative uh, era as far as healthcare uh, delivery uh, in the U.S. I mean, the, the way it used to be is that the more you did, the more you got paid. And so if you had a patient that had complications, it actually could be beneficial for the, for the provider. And now we're really moving away towards a value-based uh, system. And, and what does that mean? Well, what that means is the focus now is on maintaining health and preventing disease. And actually, one of the uh, pillars of patient blood management actually happens to be modifying anemia. If you look at the studies, all of the studies show that for the operative patient, one of the greatest risk factors in terms of predicting adverse outcomes is anemia. And so the, the field of patient blood management has done a marvelous job in terms of, of addressing that. And of course, the regulators and the government, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, also want to make sure that we decrease the, how we spend on health care and the consumption of resources. And patient blood management does a very nice job in that regard as well. Well, we talked some about evidence-based practice. That's kind of a word that wasn't existent <laughs> when I got out of med school. We just did stuff. But now the mantra is evidence-based practice. And and for transfusion, you know, sometimes I think, well, you know, when you look back at those guys in the Civil War, you think, well, they were really a bunch of numbskulls. And, and we might be thinking that way when we look back at us today as well. Um, but unlike modern devices and drugs, and when something comes to market now, you have to prove that it works. And so in the late 30s and early 40s, uh, the modern era of transfusion really sort of came about around World War II. Um, there was never a rigorous clinical trial for the application of blood therapies. We have just did it. Um, but the good news is that we are beginning to see trials, but the limitation is what you've heard already, is that the end point of the trials, you know, it's can I get away with X or can I get away with X minus Y? The question that's not being asked is can I look at an alternate therapy compared to X? And that's what we need. Uh, we need a way to really assess the physiology, the, 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 rather than a number, rather than hemoglobin. We also are beginning to um, get information, though I've got to say the U.S. is way behind on adverse outcomes. Um, adverse outcomes being very important in, in, uh, in the U.K. and uh, actually, you know, around the era of the HIV epidemic, guys went to jail in France related to decisions that were made. And so there are robust systems. Canada has a, a, a robust system in the Quebec, I know. Um, we're beginning to ask the question, what is it? What is it that a transfusion does? And what are the good things and then what are the bad things? You've heard about the recess trial. But one of the things you have to think about in terms of clinical trials is that um, even though it is the quote gold standard, there are limitations because if you ask the question, well, how old was the blood, for example, in the recess trial? Well, it wasn't very old because, as Steve pointed out, we weren't allowed to use the oldest blood, whereas Harvey Klein and his animal experiments did, in fact, take the oldest blood and ask that question. And so randomized trials are sort of what you can negotiate, and you can't really negotiate extremes. So they really have limitations, even though they are the quote gold standard. And the major point of all this that we say today is when we, the takeaway home message to take back home is we really got to find this. Um, we got to find a way to measure something that means something other than uh, hemoglobin. So with respect to where we are today as a nation, um, it depends on, you know, figures you believe, 
Some people say 17% of GDP. Some people say 19% of GDP is contributed towards health care. And it's growing. And that's not sustainable. Um, but so what does that mean in personal terms? I was reading the paper uh, yesterday, uh, a couple of days ago. And so there was a financial guy, and he was saying, so the average uh, American after 65, the family will spend $300,000 out of their pocket for health care. And, you know, the average American may not have that much money. So this is really something that's hitting home beyond the economic, you know, the economist. I mean, it's a real, a real challenge, and we've got to do something about it. Um, the good news is we're living longer, but that's the bad news, too, <laughs> because, you know, just because you live longer doesn't mean that you're going to be disease-free. So we've got to figure out a way to deal with that. And blood services, indeed, are something that we'll show you later, uh, are impacted by, as we age. Um, so clearly, within organizations that we run, there's a mantra that, to, to improve health care in general, and that mantra should also uh, translate over into transfusion practice. Um, so this is kind of a strange slide, um, but it's pretty easily seen visually. And these are Japan, Ireland, and Finland here. And what you see are age distributions. Um, for us guys, we're over here, and that means we don't live as long <laughs> as the gals over here. It's a sad story, but it's true. Um, and so what we're doing is we're progressing. I was born in 1950, so, you know, when I was born, there was a lot of young guys, not that many older guys. If you go 25 years, 25 years, 25 years, 25 years out to 2050, what you can see is that the old guys, a whole lot more of them, actually, than the young guys. And that creates a lot of problems, taxation-wise, healthcare-wise. It's a lot of, these are, these are <clears throat> dynamics that we are dealing with today and we have to be ready for. And so clearly there's, as shown in this slide, if you ask the question, well, okay, well, who, who in the world gets blood? And again, you know, the U.S. is kind of behind the eight ball. We, we don't know, but in Finland, they do. <laughs> in Finland, what, what you can see is that, you know, there's some kids, like Nabil takes care of, they use a lot of blood. And then, you know, all these guys in the mid zone are good. And then when you get to be my age, you're in trouble. <laughs> That means that you're likely, something's going to happen. You might have to get your hip done. You might have to get this done. You might have to get that done. And the way we do what we do today, that translates into, for most people, getting blood. And so that's a, that's a real challenge because we have limited resources. So what about the blood <clears throat> that we use today? So I said I wasn't going to put any jokes in, but this one's pretty good. So, yeah, <laughs> it's a fly in all the soup. And this really relates to, to, to storage. Blood belongs in the body, as you've seen. So I'll show you some slides and you know, kind of say the sort of same thing, but there's a panoply of adverse events, some theoretical, some they're very good animal models for, such as, um, you know, whenever you transfuse blood, you know what, half of that, not, not half of that blood, but by law, 30% of that blood can get ingested by your reticular endothelial cells, and that can cause derangements, and then that can release uh, iron. And, and you have issues with respect to uh, the uh, sopping up of nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator, so you get vasoconstriction. So the point here is that there's a lot of stuff that can happen when you transfuse a unit of blood. Now, unfortunately, in medical school, they don't teach this. <laughs> That's the real problem, is that most doctors um, get about an hour's worth of transfusion medicine uh, education I don't know, most of the time they tell, well, this is in a red cell, this is in a platelet, and this is how many you give. But there's not much of this talking in terms of the potential adverse outcomes associated with blood transfusion. So this is a slide here that shows when you store blood uh, within a bag in a solution with a preservative, what happens is that here you see at day 35, these little blebs here, um, these are real small things like, you know, like red cell 7 microns, this might be 0.1. These blebs have actually been associated with generation of thrombin. I was at the ISTH meeting, and you know, one of these real smart guys that knows how to do a lot of thrombosis stuff, they can show that thrombin antithrombin complexes are generated. So when you give a bag of blood, you're also given a bunch of these microparticles. And we, to be honest with you, we really don't know the impact. Somebody needs to do a study. But in vitro, you can show that these things increase thrombin generation. We already heard uh, Steve talked about these, uh, these challenging cells here these spheroechinocytes, and these are the cells that actually when you infuse them into a patient, they don't circulate, they get cleared because they're not normal. 
Um, but, but that's what we have to transfuse. And so there are indeed uh, limitations with what we have. Um, and so here is that challenge. The cell needs to traverse this very small aperture, so it has to be plastic, it has to be elastic, it has to stretch. Otherwise, it's going to get cleared in the, in the spleen. Very nice filtering mechanism. And so here you see a nice study of here are cells um, that are that zero days of storage, just to, fresh out of the arm. And there's a field of force here. And so what you can see is that these cells elongate. That's what they need to do to get through the capillary system. Well, those cells that are stored don't. So that's the, that's the issue. We, we, we can store blood. We can keep it kind of OK. But the reality is that what you have in your body belongs in your body. And actually, I was trying to show. Um, all right, so, here's, so, so we're talking, we sample blood from here. And then here's all the microvascular stuff here. That's, that's, that's the blood flowing in the microvascular space, all these little things. OK, so then you give a unit of blood, right? And then what happens? Well, <laughs> not very pretty. The flow is not great. So there's a lot of things that can happen. The cells are rigid. There are interactions with the endothelium. OK, thanks, Frankie. Appreciate it, man. Um, so we'll go on back. But, but, but every doctor ought to see that, because then they might think a little bit more about what we're doing when we use a blood transfusion. Well, uh, Dr. Shander and all, I mean, this is the epicenter of patient blood management here. You know, I turn around from Houston, bow to yeah, Inglewood. Um, but what you can see, he had, he had a group here, the uh, International Consensus Conference on Transfusion Outcomes. And so they got all these experts, and what they did is they looked at the literature and they said, well, let's see what happens, you know, outcomes related to blood transfusion. And so the red is um, adverse. These are publications that they search. And the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the favorable or no benefit is, is, is here. The bottom line is that there's a whole lot more red um, in this. So the articles, the observational trials report adverse outcomes. Now, of course, what you want to have is you want to have randomized trials as the gold standard, remembering their limitations. Um, this is also a nice piece from Vic Ferraris, another board member of SABM. And it shows a very, and it's about a million patients that he's got from the uh, NQ, you know, quality and surgery program. I don't even know how to say it, but that's the program. Um, and what you can see is if you look at stepwise the dose of red cells, that the mortality increases. Now, this may not mean that it is the red cell itself, but, but it's, it's the process. It's how you manage the patient. Something associated with the way that patient was managed resulted in a greater likelihood of mortality and morbidity. So these are it's, it's data that cannot be uh, ignored. But the gold standard is always the randomized trial. And so, and then on top of the gold standard is, well, this thing now where they put a whole bunch of randomized trials together and try to make the most sense out of it. So, and this is actually filtering down what you see here, this colon recurrence rate. Now, this is actually already filtered down to our surgeons because they didn't know about this. Um, and so what you can see here is that um, this forest plot favors control, which means don't give them cells. There's less likely to get recurrence. Because if you think about it, a blood transfusion is a, a great uh, immunologic experiment. Um, we match you for A and RH sometimes, but nothing else. So you put all these different antigens into people, and their immune system just kind of goes awry. You know, things happen. You, you see antigens that you don't have, and perhaps this relates to how this happens. The mechanism, I don't know what the mechanism is. I don't think anyone knows. But the point is that it is a significant antigenic challenge. Well, so also important, and this is, again, from a large database looking at the largest, you know, the most 10 common procedures, hip replacements, knee replacements, um, cardiac surgeries, uh, bypass surgeries. And what you can see here is if you look at death, and you just ask, you know, if you look at transfused and non-transfused and look at categories of death, length of stay, total charges, the bottom line is that it all favors uh, the, the patient that, that's not being transfused in terms of improved outcomes. So clearly, uh, there are a lot of signals that transfusions uh, indeed uh, can be associated with increased mortality, uh, increased complications, length of stay, infection rates. So, so really, um, as a practicing physician, um, one should strive to try to minimize that risk, recognizing that there are instances where, where you might have to deal with it. 
And so, we, we, as I mentioned before, we do have these trials that have come to fore, largely uh, since the uh, late 90s and into even this year. Um, we see a number of trials. Most of the trials, again, are these sort of non-inferiority trials looking at X versus X minus Y to see if there's no difference, but not really looking at a different threshold. With the exception of one trial, which we'll, oops, we'll talk about a little bit, they all basically show uh, non-inferiority. Trial number seven, there's some questions and we'll talk about it. Um, and so this is the, the first trial that, you know, the, the landmark study, the trick trial, and basically, you know, you've heard about it before, you see non-inferiority using seven to nine versus nine to 11 as the hemoglobin threshold. Now, a couple of important things is that uh, these patients were pretty sick. They had an Apache score of about 20 in the study. But you know what, if you looked at the patients that had low Apache scores, the ones that were pretty not as, not as acutely ill, those patients that got transfused, the death rate was, um, in the, in the non-transfused group was 8.7 versus about 16 in the group that got transfused. So big difference, sign clinically significant difference in the, in the healthier population. But that was not the primary outcome. Primary outcome was just looking at uh, non-exclusion. Now, another thing is when this trial was done, they had a lot of exclusions. They didn't want to take anybody with chronic anemia. They didn't want to take anybody who was bleeding. And they didn't want to take anybody who had a heart problem because they were concerned about whether that might be acceptable. Because these are, are bartered uh, trials as you, as you design them. So then we've heard about sepsis. And uh, so in the uh, surviving sepsis, you know, the guidelines, um, Early on in sepsis, they were saying, yeah, you've got to have a hemoglobin of 10. Well, what's that related to? I don't know. Well, and so, so but, but one thing that it was related to is, and actually I, I learned this from a colleague, if you look at the historical data, the patients that approach surgery, if they are anemic, they have a higher risk for adverse outcomes. And so what happened is that that somehow or another got misconstrued or mis misinterpreted that we've got to get them at 10 because that, you know, the, the issue is that patients that present with anemia have more adverse outcomes than patients that, in fact, are uh, well constituted with respect to their hemoglobins. Well, at any rate, so that was the question. So, that, so they asked the question with the usual stuff, okay, we're gonna have a hemoglobin seven versus nine or higher. And what they see, what they saw here looking at uh, pro probability of survival, what you can see, these are really sick people because about 40% of them died. Um, there was no difference uh, in, the, uh, more in the restrictive transfusion group versus the group that received liberal, liberal transfusions. Um, they did, of course, exclude life-threatening bleeding, ischemia, and implantation. And that's an important point. So all these studies say, well, we're not going to deal with the bleeding patient. So that's why the Villanueva trial was so important because it you know, says, you know what, we can manage bleeding. Well, you know, just because you're bleeding doesn't mean you need to get blood. And so, so that, act, that trial actually added some important uh, information for us. And so, you know, they say, well, the new threshold is now seven. At any rate, but m maybe what we need is the new way to determine whether somebody needs to be transfused is, and I don't know what that answer is, but is needs to be determined. So um, some time ago, um, you know, I was meeting with our cardiac surgeons trying to figure out how we could reduce blood use because, you know, Dr. Cooley was the main surgeon at our place, and he always had an interest in trying to conserve blood. And so, uh, you know, I worked up this sort of complicated scheme, basically saying that if you're not bleeding, um, and if you're not really, uh, you know, coagulopathic and you're just anemic, well, I don't know. I guess what we'll do, and this is, these are all bartered. I mean, how did we get eight? I have no idea. <laughs> so, yeah, let's make it eight. And so, so we said, well, we would transfuse at eight and we'll give one unit at a time. And then we recheck. And of course, we excluded all the guys who were high risk. They had to be first time bypasses, no failure, uh, nobody on pressors, nobody over 65. So, very select group not representing, you know, a whole bunch of people. Um, and so what we did is we had this sort of thing at the Texas Heart Institute where they had these parameters that they measured all the patients. You could just get it from a database. And so what we saw is when we applied those um, techniques to those individuals, that is the gradual transfusion, that there was no difference as far as adverse outcomes. So we thought, well, that's pretty good. So at any rate, so we wrote it up. Um, and so subsequently, there have been other trials. And so here's a trial from Dr. Hajar. Um, looking at, again, a group of patients. Now, in her case, um, she was looking at more a uh, mixed bag of cardiac surgery patients. Lots of exclusions here. Um, and then, you know, again, if their protocol, if somebody got shocked or they're bleeding, they're going to give them blood and, you know, 
deviate from the protocol. Bottom line is that they really didn't see uh, a significant difference there at around eight. So, so you know what? All the surgeons now, the cardiac gas, are, ah, yeah, we'll take eight. <laughs> you know, so, but the question is, what is the truth? What's the best way to do it? We don't know. So um, <clears throat> this is the Murphy trial, and the, this is the one that's creating all the controversy. In this particular trial, what they did is they looked at important outcomes, serious infections as, as, as you know, sepsis or wound infection. Uh, if you've got ischemic gut or your kidneys aren't working, within three months. Now this trial has also secondary, the secondary measure, outcome measure, is the one that got everybody in trouble, because that's death. But the way trials are designed, you have to say death, you know, just make it, is it going to be death at 90, you know, 90 days, 30 days, 60 days? Okay, let's make it 90 days. Okay, so death in 90 days. And excluded are people with hematologic diseases, emergent surgery. For some reason, I don't know, limbs seem to be important. <laughs> Can't figure that one out. Um, so at any rate, so, um, so here are the outcomes. So basically what you can see is that the primary outcomes, infection, no problem, ischemia, no problem, but somehow or another at 90 days, there was more death. And it's about 16 patients altogether. So I was going through the supplemental, you know, I was going through this the last couple of days. Why did these people die? What happened? And so if you look at it, it's kind of interesting. They had 10 people in the, um, in the group that received restrictive transfusions, they had to go back to surgery. And you know what? When you retake, when you go back to surgery, it doesn't have anything to do with your anemia that much. It's just a, there's a surgical problem. Um, they also had a bunch of people that had some death otherwise unexplained. But then when you look at the curve, it's kind of interesting because at 30 days, there's no difference. At 90 days, there is. So you kind of wonder, well, wait a minute. I wonder what the hemoglobin was on day 45. <laughs> it's probably the same. So, so, so again, uh, the randomized trials, and then this, the power of this, you know, it's 0.045, right on the line, 1 to, you know, 1.67. So to me, rather than say, okay, we're going to transfuse everybody up to 11 or so, this says, well, we need to revisit the data. Perhaps we need another trial. Um, interesting group here. I hate all these forest plots, but one group that we often think about, and we give a pass in our place, are people that have uh, LV dysfunction because you can't increase your heart rate or your cardiac output because your heart isn't working. And so what's interesting is in this study, they actually didn't see any difference in the outcomes of those treated with the more restrictive transfusions, including in that, in that population. So that's maybe something we might want to rethink back at the home base. But so hemoglobin, what can we do this better? So, you know, we were sitting around one day, and so a bunch of us got together, uh, you know, the surgeons, anesthesia, anesthesiologists, others. So, so let's make up a pathway. <laughs> so, okay, let's make up a pathway. So, so, so what we did is, well, what's good? I don't know. Lactate is good because when you don't get the energy you need, you end up being, you know, anaerobic glycolysis. Um, or or as you're mixed, you know, you're extracting too much oxygen. Because actually, you know, one of the studies that when you look at organ failure when you're about to die, is when your oxygen extraction ratio is about less than 50%. So at any rate, uh, mixed, you know, uh, O2 sat is, you know, it's a mixed bag, and some can argue, well, you know, what do you know about the brain? Well, what do you know about the heart? I don't know. So anyway, we picked 70, because there have been some studies in sepsis to show that, that was important. And um, so we monitored a lot of stuff, and it was kind of complex, because, you know, getting a fellow to follow this kind of protocol, one it was for, you know, your hypotensive, and one is if you're normotensive. Um, and so this is just a normal tensive uh, arm. So the patients had a systolic pressure greater than 90, uh, low central venous pressure, low CVO2, SCVO2, or, or high uh, lactate. And so we had this scheme here, so kind of bifurcated based upon what your hemoglobin is. And so, you know, if your hemoglobin's over 8, then you get, you get lactated ringer boluses, and you look to see if you get improvement in your SCVO2 and your lactate and all this stuff. And it took, you know, a nurse practitioner a lot of time to bird dog everybody and make sure they got it right. And to be honest with you, we didn't have enough numbers. I sure I'd like to have a thousand, but we don't. But in the small number of people that we had, it's kind of interesting. What we saw is that if you looked at um, ICU admission rate, that was uh, significantly reduced. And then if you looked at length of stay, it's kind of marginal, but eh, maybe, maybe a little bit there. But, but, but at any rate, no one did, no one fared poorly. But this is the kind of stuff that Bigger studies need to be done, figuring out what the right, you know, endpoints are physiologically so we don't end up talking about hemoglobin, which is a measure 
but it's clearly a surrogate. Um, I don't know. I guess I didn't do a real good job of publicity because um, we decreased the blood use a lot, but I didn't get a bonus. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. So Villanueva. So a very important trial that we heard about earlier today. Um, and this, you know, I like trials where it's pretty clear. There's bleeding, and you know, with GI bleeding, it's pretty good. You can see it, uh, or in the case of melanin, you can smell it. Um, so you, you know what's going on. Um, adults, of course. And uh, you know, one thing that's important here is that they, they didn't take light cases, meaning anybody had a nice, nice juicy hemoglobin can't get in, or anybody that had a, a not so bad score that the GI guys used to assess your risk can't get in. So these were people that were, you know, potentially at risk. Um, and as we've heard before, you know, it was in seven to nine, monitoring the hemoglobin, uh, you know, a bunch of times. And uh, so, so, so the most important thing of it all was getting to fix the issue. Um, because, you know, uh, blood's a crutch. The, it, it rides you to the next day. You can watch somebody bleed and keep giving red cells and you know, finally get to the fix. But what you need is an immediate fix, and that's where this came in. And so we had a nice discussion with our GI guys. So, hey, you know what? You guys need to do scoping within uh, six hours. Well, we didn't get it quite to six. We're at eight. <laughs> but, but we cut it down from what it was before. It's very important to fix the problem. And so what you can see is this trial is really a, a, a blockbuster thing because, as pointed out earlier, it actually improves survival. Here are the guys who got restrictive transfusion, and here are the guys who got liberal transfusion. You more survived that didn't get blood. And also, if you looked at other stuff, well, you know, you'd expect, yeah, they got less blood. That's easy. Uh, but if you look at further bleeding, because of that pressure deal, the portal pressure, you put blood in and you, you know, increase, you pop the cork more or less. Um, that is a tremendously important finding. A lot of positive findings here. Less death, less adverse events, less volume overload because you're just dumping blood into somebody. Uh, so here's our place, and like I said, this is probably uh, Inglewood here. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, 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 good to it's, good to, it's good to measure where you are, because I can use these data, you know, to get our guys to start acting right. But what we're, so what we're doing is we're going to try to use the Massimo system. It's a non-invasive hemoglobin monitor, and what we're, what we're doing with it is we're not using it to replace the blood test, because I'm a lab guy, I got to do the blood test. But what we're doing, a lot of transfusion is anticipatory transfusion. It, something might happen, you know, and, and you, can't go, you, know, you can't go home and go to sleep because the guy might drift down to four. And, so at any rate, having these kind of uh, monitoring uh, capabilities, I think, is very important. And so we basically stole the, uh, you know, exclusion criteria, except for the leg part, from um, um, Villanueva. And so what we're going to do, um, as soon as all the devices come in, because we don't have them in right now, is apply this uh, uh, strict criteria for transfusion, less than seven, to our patients. And so w what actually may happen is if we're, if we're lucky, obviously you can see reduced blood, amount, uh, blood use. But really, w what we're thinking, of, we may be even, may even be able to keep, because these are hemodynamically stable patients, we might be able to keep some of them out of the ICUs and improve, you know, hospital throughput. But that's something that we have in planning. So we've heard about Harvey Klein. He's one of my mentors. Um, and he's, he's, a, he's a smart guy. Um, and so he put this paper together, this editorial, and, and it really hits the point. Um, so in a randomized trial, any of you know about uh, Plavix, Clopidogrel? So a randomized trial shows it gives, it improves survival in patients that get it to have coronary problems, right? But you know what? A third of the people who are getting the drug had no benefit because they looked at the aggregate group but not the individual. So where we need to go in terms of making the decisions, yeah, we have the randomized trials to give us a guide, but we need to have a way to know how to treat each individual patient. Now, that can be from, you know, just looking at the patient or whatever, but it really would be nice to have some way to assess the physiology rather than just, you know, the guy's tachycardic, oh, he's not responding. Uh, it would be nice to know when trouble is coming, and we don't have that right now. Um, so we talked about um, nitric oxide. Uh, nitric oxide is something that's really important 
that I don't fully understand. I don't think many people do. But at any rate, what happens is that there's this uh, nit nit nitric oxide synthase. The endothelial cells make nitric oxide to keep the blood vessels dilated. And so when hemoglobin is in, in its tense state, it binds nitric oxide. And then when it releases um, nitric oxide, it um, causes a vasodilatation. So what happens, though, is if you give blood that's uh, hemolyzed, as in a, a unit of blood, and, and this is well known in the sickle cell population because they have chronic hemolysis and they have NO deficiency and therefore a lot of flow and vascular problems, transfusing blood affects the NO balance and it can then lead to the vasoconstriction that we saw. And so this um, is what happens when blood is flowing through your body. And the way this is set up is it's rats. And so what they do is they take the rats and they bleed them down to a hematocrit of 30. Um, and then some of them they will exchange with fresh blood. Uh, I guess they didn't really define fresh. I guess it's just hot out of the arm. And others that will transfuse stored blood. And their rats is 14 days. That's how it looks compared to the human at 35 days. And so what you can see is that when you do that exchange transfusion to the rat, um, that the fresh blood, this is, let me talk about the layers here. So here's the blood, and this is what we were talking about before. So the red cells are in the center, and then where a lot of the um, energy and, the, and, and nutrient exchange takes place is in the cell-free layer right here. Very important layer. Um, you know, I, I'm not a microcirculatory person, but I trust well, Amy Sy, she knows what she's talking about. And so what happens is that the, the bigger this area is, the better as far as exchange. So what you can see here is that the fresh blood's better, and so here's the stored blood. So therefore, your flow is, your, uh, your, your, your cell-free layer is decreased. Uh, likewise, if you look at um, what this thing is called the temporal, the variations, because the point is that if the cells can't elongate the cells, then, then what they do is they tumble like dishes, and then they interfere with how that um, cell-free zone looks. And shown here is what you see is a shift so that, um, with the fresh blood, the, um, the, the, most of the, the, the layer, the, the, what I'm trying to say, the area to the zone is higher, and it's a smaller cell-free zone that you have with these cells. It's, it's, it's an interesting theoretical, but here's actually the, the flow proof. And so this looks at the flow going through the microcirculation. And so here's the animal that's hemodiluted. And then contrast this to the person that's getting, or the animal that's getting stored blood what you have is a slow, you have a reduction in flow. And so again, this is in essence an example of what happens when you transfuse a patient. You're, you're not actually improving the circulation, you're deteriorating the circulation with many of the cells. The cells they use at Johns Hopkins. <laughs> and so here you can also see, I think what's important, and this is flow in another study she did earlier. And what you can see, so here are the animals that are hemodiluted and they're measuring flow. Even the fresh cells um, have an, a negative impact on the rate of flow. So, you know, so fresh blood is better, but it ain't the normal way, and stored blood is even worse. And so this actually is also shown in terms of looking at the impact of fresh, and this is oxygen tension, um, and more importantly, look at the tissues and venular. So the old blood is a lot worse as far as the oxygen tension contrasted to the new blood. So the take-home messages really are, um, well, if you got to give blood, you know, do one at a time. Uh, most of the patients seem to tolerate, he oops, hemoglobin is seven, but we really don't know what the right answer is. Um, the studies uh, are limited in, in terms of the inpatient setting. We don't know about outpatients. We got to have that serologic, oh, sorry, I'm serologic, I'm a transfusion guy. We got to have the physiologic parameter of red cell transfusion. Um, you know, really, and Jeff Carson will say this because, you know, there's a guy <laughs> that was, uh, he waved his hand, he was in the ASH meeting because he was doing the choosing wise. He says, Dr. Carson, you, have you ever known what it feels to have a hemoglobin of eight? And so he says, well, don't, don't pay attention to the hemoglobin. <laughs> Follow the symptoms of the patient. So, you know, some patients may need it at eight. Some may not need it at five. It depends on the patient. You know, I just remember a sickle cell patient. We saw a hemoglobin of three, eight or something like this. We were running into the room. So where's the patient? Oh, he's outside smoking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it depends on the patient. And so conservative transfusion is even applicable from the Villanueva trial in a bleeding patient. 
Now, so here's the extra stuff that I wanted to give you because, you know, it's so important because we have these new drugs now. Uh, here, oops, sorry. Here's the bigotran. And one of the things you want to know about these agents is how long do they stay in the, blood, in the body? These, these uh, no, novel oral anticoagulants stay about 12 hours. It's the easiest thing to remember, about 12 hours. Um, and see, what else do you want to know? So, yeah, how do you get rid of them? And so an important thing is that the kidneys, so if your kidneys aren't working, they will stay in, in your body longer. A little bit less with the Pixaban, but the Rabaroxaban and the Pixaban guys are in a fight because, you know, those, they're trying to use this to say, well, my drug's better than your drug. There have never been head-to-head -head studies. Um, but but they, they get cleared by the kidneys. And then is there a test to monitor? Okay, so you have a patient that comes in the hospital that's on one of these drugs. Is it gone? Because the way they market these tests is you don't have to do any testing because, you know, you don't have to do any testing. It's not like INRs. You don't have to do them. Well, the reality is that you can test for them using a thrombin time for dabigatran, a uh, re regular lovenox assay for um, rabaroxaban or pixaban. Um, people, some people say, well, you should have a calibrated curve. Well, we've tested the low, you know, regular old low molecular weight versus calibrated. It's not that much difference. And for what you want to do is to clear somebody for surgery, it works. Um, so here's uh, the, the wonder drug that just got approved, the, um, I can't pronounce it, aduruzumab. Um, and so here's what happens when you put it into a patient um, and you look for the thrombin clotting time at, 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 at a re relatively low level, you can see the thrombin clotting time ba basically goes away because it neutralizes the effect of the drug. Um, and so here are patients that are receiving uh, the, um, the drug, the bigotran, and here they measure thrombin times in the patients. And so you can see that this is five minutes. By five minutes, it's gone, uh, as measured by the thrombin time, which is a very sensitive test. And the same thing applies if you measure the PTT. Now, uh, this, these data are from the, the study that just got reported, the reverse AD trial, the pilot phase of the AD trial. And I said the drug just got approved, I don't know, a week ago or so. And so here are thrombin times. And I mean, you know, uh, they all stayed low. One guy, one dot came up at 24 hours. But if you look at, you know, the rebound, it's really not that much, uh, it's not significant. It's not a significant level of drug. So very effective, very fast in, in neutralizing. And so this is the Indexinet, and by the way, this is one that I did by Stockton, but I, I, it, I, I, again, I'm not trying to push it. Um, and it, what they did is they modified uh, factor, uh, factor 10. So this is a modif they cut out this and they cut out that. And what they did is so they, they made it so the active site's not there and it can't bind to the coagulation system and serve as an anticoagulant. It simply serves as a sponge to eliminate uh, a drug effect. And um, so here you can see what happened. This was presented at the uh, American College of Cardiology meeting. And so here are guys on placebo, and this is the anti-10A uh, assay, anti-9A assay anyway. Uh, and so you can see that, boy, this thing's really high here. It's kind of strange. At any rate, that's a weird one. It really should be anti-10A. Maybe it's a misprint. Oh, yeah, so the, at any rate, so, so here you see it. But you give the drug and boom, it just falls like a rock. Uh, it does come back in, in terms of some exposure, but if you look at uh, thrombin generation assays and other more sensitive assays, it's a meaningless return. Well, here, here it is. Uh, here's thrombin generation assay. And so what you can see is that um, with the, um, with the indexinet, the thrombin generation, your ability to make thrombin, which means you make clot, goes up nicely as contrasted to uh, the control. Uh, so again, it's early phase five, uh, phase uh, two trial, phase three trials, and um, expect that it will probably come out soon. Very important is that if you have a patient who's on one of these drugs, and this is a, this is easy to remember, 12 hours, right, is a half life. So that means that 12 hours after you got 50 percent. That means that 24 hours you got 25 percent, and then you know on and on. So so if you wait two days, basically you're going to have less than five percent of the drug, assuming normal function normal renal function. If the renal function is off, then go read this paper by uh, Spiropoulos, and, you know, he has modified uh, uh, clearance mechanisms. Uh, and then the last thing here on the anticoagulants is this, and that is that, um, so if you talk to, the way it works is that you got you to work it out with the surgeon. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a bothering thing. When do you restart the drug after you do the surgery? Uh, you know, so, some, you know, these guys would suggest, well, you can start at 24 hours. There's no science about this. 
it's a bartering deal. You, you work it out with you, but you don't continue it through the surgery. Uh, just a word or two about anemia. Uh, we said anemia is prevalent. It sure is, as, as prevalent in as old people as it is in the kids. Um, so here you see um, people that are 85 plus. Man, it's got about a, you know, the bone marrow doesn't work as well when, you, when you're that old. Uh, and here I am, so about 9% of my guys are, uh, are, are anemic. Probably about 9% are demented, too. <laughs> so it's, it's a balance. Um, <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, I can't get that slide, I'm demented. Uh, so so um, if you look at um, total, and this is from the NHANE study, a large survey of America, uh, you know, sponsored by our government. That's where your tax dollars go. This is a good part of the tax dollars spend. Um, and what you can see here is that, boy, there is a lot of iron deficiency in, in America. Uh, and so one of the th easiest things to do is to replete iron. And so all you got to do is what Dr. 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 Gobi was talking about earlier today, bring people in a week ahead of time or a couple of weeks ahead of time so they just don't show up on the day of surgery. Oh, they're anemic. Well, you know, you can treat them, uh, and there's a lot of iron deficiency out there. So here's iron deficiency in our place. Uh, and, and i I, I got to admit, so um, I walk past the patients that are going to have hip surgery come in a month ahead of time. And somehow or another, they can't get them down to me. But, but at any rate, um, 36% of them have preoperative anemia in the males and 32% in the females. Uh, again, it marries up with that data. And then if we look at our cardiac population, uh, what we can see is that uh, using hemoglobin at 12, 43% of the females are anemic, 20% of the males. And if you're anemic, you get twice as much blood as if you're not. I mean, you know, so, so I'm working on them. We'll get an anemia clinic together. And if you look at these data here, what you can see is that um, across the world, and this is... Uh, one of the papers that Dr. Shander uh, uh, participated in. It's not only us that have anemia, there's anemia everywhere, and anemia across all categories. And the strongest predictor of preoperative transfusion is the uh, hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin is very good for predicting when you're going to get blood. And so the American Society of Anesthesia is now saying, hey, you know what? They, they said kind of give you a halfway green light on ESAs, halfway, um, and, and with or without iron. They kind of, you know, said that, and then you administer iron to patients that are deficient, but you got to find them to get, in order to give them the iron. And so here's this uh, study that I was talking about with the um, ESAs uh, in Italy. You know, they do this in Italy, not so much in the States. 80,000 units, 48 hours before surgery. And so these guys here, and this is your uh, transfusion rate. Uh, these guys here uh, are the guys that didn't uh, get the ESAs. And these are the guys who got the ESAs, so that's a, that's a pretty significant difference. Doesn't make any difference if you're over 13, and if you're really anemic, you, you know, you got you to do more than treat them two, out, two days before. Um, there, 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 there are guidelines and algorithms. I, I stole this one from the SABM web, website, so just join SABM and you'll have all the answers you need <laughs> if you want to know how to treat anemia. And I, I think that is the last slide, so I appreciate your attention and uh, open up for questions.